Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, good evening. My name is Gary, and I'm an alcoholic. My throat's a little raw. My I must have paid everybody to get here today. Stand up. Speak up, this is my voice. <laughs> is that better? Yes. Okay. I actually have turned into a little softer voice because uh, being a general contractor and yelling and screaming at men all day long, I, my voice gets sore and I don't want to be that kind of a person when I'm talking to people that are trying to listen to a message of recovery of some sort. So if I don't talk loud enough, raise your hand and I'll, I'll speak up a little more. But anyway, I'm just grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous to give me a great second chance on being somebody I should have been a long time ago and I didn't know how. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, if you're in it for the very first time, or maybe your last time, I don't know, I know this, that this was the very first meeting I ever went to and I got coerced into coming here. And I did walk around with my hands in my pocket because I thought they wanted some money or they were going to take something from me, so... But I sat and listened to somebody speak, and, uh, you know, I related to what that person said, and it made a big difference in my life. And today I'm just grateful for what I am. I uh, I didn't know I could be somebody like this. But uh, I'm going to throw out a disclaimer here real fast, like if I've offended anybody over the years or caused any resentments in your life, I certainly want to apologize for that right now. No harm done. That way there we can probably, we'll still be friends at the end of this thing, so. Anyway, uh, I got to tell you a little bit about my background. Everybody's kind of curious, where'd you come from? And they don't hear that too much when I speak at these other groups. And, uh, I, uh, I just talk about solution more than anything else. Uh, being a contractor, I needed a map. I needed some kind of a map to direct me. And if I didn't follow directions out of the blueprints that I was building these structures with, they were going to fall down. And so consequently, I've been that way ever since I got in here. You know, I, I, I tried to be cute sometimes with, with funny stuff, but it always got me into trouble, especially with the opposite species. And uh, it was always the skirts that got me into trouble, so I had to be careful about that. I mean, I watched my dad. I, I'm, I'm the oldest of five children, uh, four brothers and a sister. And I, we fought every day. My my brother and my, my next brother down, we fought every day over clothes, over shoes. I mean, I grew up in a house where if you didn't say, I get my chair back, you didn't get it. You were stuck on the carpet. And when you're laying on orange shag carpet, it's pretty dirty, you know. It's pretty dirty. So uh, I was born in Iowa, of all places, Sioux City, Iowa, a little city out there on the Missouri River in the northwest territory and we were raised in Minnesota for about four or five years and then the old man decided to move to, to California you know and it looked like the Clampets when we came out here we had a, <laughs> we had a 52 Studebaker with stuff piled on it my mother was driving that big Buick special and kids and diapers and everything flying I mean just it, it was nuts and uh, he, he moved us out to uh, Santee of all places you know out there in the East County where it was all dairy farms and hay bales. That's what I grew up with. That was my fun. And chasing uh, rattlesnakes and, and fishing down in the San Diego River Basin and catching bluegill and and crawdads and everything else and shooting with BB guns. And and, and that's where my background came from. I, I mean, I grew up out in East County, so I didn't know that there was people west of the Mission Gorge Trail Road. I didn't know that. And there was a whole other group of people out there that I couldn't relate to. The conversations were different and those sorts of things. But I did like the beach. I liked the beach a lot. So uh, we used to go down there quite a bit. And I'd ride my bike down there and then pedal all the way back over the gorge and go to Santee. And uh, we grew up on a street over in the Big Rock area where they didn't have street lights, no curbs. I mean, they barely had curbs, no sidewalks. And the police were afraid to go down there. And I don't know why, because I must have been our house. I don't know, because uh, you know the old man used to get mad at my mom if he didn't if she didn't go down and buy us beer so we could watch the Looney Tunes. 
and some other stuff. You know, I mean, that was our life. You know, we, uh, and uh, we, I can't tell you how many fights we had at our house and how many times the sheriff showed up there. You know, it was, it was one of those things where the sheriffs would show up and they knew my dad by the first, by his first name. Uh, and I remember this one particular party we had. There was about 50 of us in the backyard. And we're all out there, the stereo blasting away, and we're, we're drinking up a storm. And uh, all of a sudden, the sheriff's helicopter with the lights, flying one of those MASH helicopters, you know what I'm saying? The lights shining down in the backyard. And uh, the old man gets out in the middle, and we're all smoking joints, and he says, give me one of those things. He's smoking on it, you know, and that didn't do anything to him because he was a heavy smoker. And he tells all of us to flip off the helicopter. <laughs> This is this is the honest God truth. It went like this, and we're all laughing. Next thing you know, three sheriff cars pull up on the door. They knock on the door. The old man opens it up, and he says, and the first thing he says is, hey, Tom, hey, Bob, how you doing? John, you got these kids in the backyard. You can't do this all the time. And he told the cops, he said, don't worry. Val's making, Val was my mother. She's making everybody breakfast in the morning. They're all spending the night. So two of the officers said, she's cooking. We'll be back in the morning. <laughs> so that's what I kind of grew up in. I don't know if that's functional for you. I mean, it wasn't for me. I never was asked to. We never asked to mow the lawn, any of that stuff. We were like the wild Indians. I swear to God, it was wild Indian time. And when the uh, the parties that we have and the, and, and the girls that came over to those kind of parties, they were tough. Real tough and scared, I think, you know. But uh, we had a really good time. And one of my brothers, who has MS now, I'm sorry to hear that about him, but he uh, was one of the largest drug dealers out in East County there. And this one particular night, I didn't know what was going on, you know. I, next thing I know, he's got all these bottles, of sparkling bottles in the back of his little love truck, and he's going up in the mountains to water his marijuana plants hidden behind the manzanita bushes. He had about 50 of them. And I got to tell you, folks, that was the best laughing gas I ever smoked. <laughs> it was good. It was good. I mean, uh, grade school was just something I didn't like, especially at, in kindergarten. That was the first, that was the toughest two years of my life, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember when the teacher was telling me, you got to take a nap. And I said, no. And I threw the child, the blanket back at her, and I was just mad. I wanted to go out in the playground. So I got sent to the principal's office, and that was the start of my, uh, you know, trying to get to conform to law and order and all that shit, you know, and I didn't want to do that. And uh, many times I've been there. And, uh, you know, when you're a freshman in high school and you've got a gambling casino, you know, you're pitching coins against the wall, and you got a guy at one end of the locker room and over here watching teachers, and you're picking your coins up. That's how I made my money. I'd play poker on uh Friday and Saturday nights, and I'd keep score at uh, the bowling alley every night. I'd hitchhike out down there, and that was my life. I mean, I wanted things like food. <laughs> I wanted a new pair of tennis shoes, you know. I wanted something other than just le leftovers. I mean, my freshman year, I put cardboard in my shoes. Nobody knew it. I just shuffled down the hallway like I was sand in the floor. I didn't know any different. Uh, we had uh, My dad made beds out of redwood lumber. Bought used mattresses. I mean, that's the way I was. And I, everybody else had normal lives. And this one friend of mine, he always had peanut butter and strawberry jam. I'd go down there and make one of those sandwiches all the time. I loved it. Because I didn't get that at the house. We didn't have those luxuries. We had powdered milk. Uh, let's see, brown sugar for syrup. And uh, a lot of pancakes and mashed potatoes. <laughs> Whatever it took. Because you got... You got when you got a whole household of Indians, you know, so to speak. It just takes food to fill them up. And God bless my mom, man, Sweden Norwegian. She knew how to cook. She burnt everything, <laughs> everything. If you wanted toast, you could see her in the kitchen <laughs> scraping it off. Yeah, mom, that looks good. It's supposed to be black. Got to get it cooked all the way through. <laughs> So every time one of my brothers has a barbecue and I know my sister's cooking, I says, geez, have you got a chainsaw? This, this steak is going to be real tough, you know? Then she gets mad and slaps me. But, you know, uh, the thing about it is I, uh, I did, when you don't know, you don't know. It's like Alcoholics Anonymous. You're here 
because I'm assuming you want to stay sober and have a life of substance of some kind, right? I didn't know that alcohol was going to take me to the depths of, you know, bad places, very bad places. I got into more fights because of alcohol. I really did. I'd get into a blackout, and next thing you know, somebody told me, did you, did you see that fight you're in? No, I didn't feel anything till the next day. And uh, the, the high school was that way. And then when I got out of high school, I got involved with a bunch of bikers out in East County, <clears throat> and I'd be out at Namani Park at 18, 19 years old, hanging around a group that was uh, an undesirable, scary group. But I felt comfortable there because... I didn't have any of those abandonment issues that I did with other people. They always stood in my corner, and I wanted that. You know, I wanted somebody who's going to stand in when I was in a jam. Because most of the fights I ever got into, I'd look at the person next to me. I said, "You're going to stand behind me? No doubt, Gary. I got your backside covered." As soon as it started, what happened, folks? You looked around. You're by yourself, and that's the way it was. So, uh, the alcohol was a way of getting that false courage inside this system. And when you put bad fuel into your machine, you know what's going to happen? It's not going to run right. It's going to be like pistons missing, you know? And so alcohol became my king, so to speak. And in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous in chapter 11, it talks about we became subjects of king alcohol, you know? And when we did that, then we put alcohol ahead of everything else. Because I lost, I lost a lot of great things in AA. I really, I mean, I was in alcohol when I was drinking, I lost a lot of good things. All the gifts that God had given me, I lost. I was married for 26 years, and uh, she had enough of my shit and kicked me in the Huevos Rancheros to the curb, and I was out, gone. And then I had to deal with the reality of life, and I just put more alcohol in my system. I just poured it in because it was an easy way of escaping reality. Now, I'll tell you, those first three years of my life, that was pretty tough because there's a guy in here, after I went to this meeting, that kind of took me under his wings, and he goes, Gary, you know what step one is? I says, yeah. I admitted I was an alcoholic, and my life had become completely unmanageable. Well, it was the second part of that first step that got my ass kicked. My life was totally unmanageable. I mean, my, the way I paid my bills, I put them on a table, piled them up. At the end of the month, shoved them off and put a new stack on there. <laughs> I'd write checks on there. I'd send it off. I know I'd write notices to the bill collectors, and I would put my name on there, deceased, and mail it to them. <laughs> That'd give me about three or four days of reprieve. Or I'd wrinkle the check up really good, stuff it in the envelope, and send it off, you know, because they couldn't do it with a machine. They had to hand and I'd give me another three days before I got the money. So I was always chasing this money thing, and it always seemed to get me in the way because I made bad choices by prostituting myself to get this dollar in my life that I thought was going to make me happy. You know, I thought the money was going to make me happy, and it just wasn't. What was going to make me happy was that relationship I had with the God of my own understanding, like it says on step three. When I got that into my life, and I worked that third step prayer where it says, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou will. Relieve me of what? The bondage of self. See, my self was kicking my butt. Now, if you're an alcoholic in here, you're selfish and self-centered, which is the root of your problem that it says on 62. Now, be aware, I'm going to throw out a lot of page numbers here. This is the way I share. Sometimes it's, people like it, some people they don't. I only know one way to share, and that's the solution. Because, you know what, if you try to figure this thing on your own, you're going to be in trouble. Because inside these rooms, everybody's going to be warm and fuzzy with you. But when you leave that door and get out there in the real world, they don't give a shit. And life is going to twist you up. It's going to make you think like, wow, what's the use? Sometimes you, you'll get this, I don't give a shit attitude, and next thing you know, you're drinking again. And for an alcoholic to drink is to die, right? Because it says right in there, you know, on 98, wife or no wife? Job or no job. If we put our dependency ahead of, if we put our dependency upon people, places, and things ahead of our dependency upon God, what's going to happen? We're going to drink. I can always tell the ones that read the book, they got their heads nodding. And, and that's okay. You know, give it some time. You're going to be in this thing for a very long, long, long time. I got sentenced by the AA police to go to meetings the rest of my life, and they handcuffed me in here. 
That was fun. You know, and they said, Gary, keep coming back. That was all they keep coming back. Or like my buddy over here, and I would say, let go, let go. I said, you don't understand, Randy. I can get this girl to love me again. I know I can. <laughs> I mean, I'd talk about an obsession for the first three years. I had this girlfriend living with me. God bless her. I love her today. She's, she's married to Larry, and she's super nice, man. I mean, well, we talk, and we're great friends. But we, she, we were living together for a short period of time, and I, I booted her out because I didn't want to live with an alcoholic. <laughs> Remember, I'm not an alcoholic, right? Sure. And uh, we still hung on to dating occasionally, that sort of thing. And I thought I could get it all back when she came back from from rehab and she was all sobered up. And she did a 12-step on me to get into the program. And I thought, wow, this, this is nice. Maybe I ought to keep trying with this one, you know. But uh, I didn't. And uh, I don't know if you remember your last days of drinking, but I sure do about Carrie. Because my last day of drinking, I remember that. She was a bartender at a bar. And that day I drank two bottles of Jack Daniels and a case of beer in a 24-hour period. And I woke up the next day in my, in this, uh, duplex over in Elk, uh, I mean in La Mesa there. And I lived about a block away from all the taverns because it was real close. I could just crawl home and walk, you know? And I woke up that next day in the morning, came to, tripped over a carpet of bottles, Urine smell all through the apartment. Terrible. And I waddled into the bathroom. And for the first time in a lot of years, I looked into the eyes of what, in my eyes. And this is the honest God truth. I stared into my eyes for one or two minutes and I saw, I, I don't know what you want to call it, an image or whatever coming right back at me. And I saw the face of a smile. I said, shit, this guy's trying to take me out. And I got down on my knees and I went, get out. And I made a decision to stop right then. And I haven't had a drink since. That was over nine and a half years ago. So that's what I did for Gary. See, one thing about people, they say they're going to stop drinking. And I don't know about you. Has anybody in here ever gone to the bathroom part time? <laughs> you can't. You make a decision, you go. It's the same darn thing in this, in this industry. Make a decision and stick to it, no matter how hard it gets. Because it's not going to be an easy process. This is as easy as you want it to be. Following directions out of the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Step two is pretty clear, right? It got me going real fast. It came to believe in a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I got a flash for you, folks. Sanity is not doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's insanity. <clears throat> So I started following directions in here, and that wasn't easy because after I found this God of my own understanding being raised in, 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 a, in a traditional way of believing in God, they tried to get me to believe in this God that they thought I should believe in. And that was like being handcuffed. It was like being a prisoner. And when I, when I came in here and they said, hey, you can find this God of your own understanding, I said, Wow. When I did that, there was freedom. <clears throat> I didn't feel, I didn't have guilt grabbing on to me. Now, you can believe any way you want, but I mean, your own understanding is how you're going to get this thing in. Because there's three components that make us an alcoholic. The mental obsession, followed by the physical craving. And the third one, that's the kick-ass one, is that spiritual malady. Because if you really digest and understand what it takes to get sober and stay sober, once the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten up mentally and physically. That's a promise. Now, I know a lot of you go to meetings where they read the ninth step promises. That's, that's good stuff. But this is a short little sentence right there on page 64 that talks about that one sentence right underneath the resentment, Right? And I said, whoa, this is good stuff. You know, I had a couple of sponsors and, uh, the first year and some, about three mentors trying to settle me down. Gary, relax, relax. I says, I am relaxed. Can't you tell? We, we understand, Gary. You're going to meetings and nobody wants to sit by you, you know? And I had this red bandana on and, and I wore these dark sunglasses and I put stuff on both sides of my chair so nobody would talk to me. <laughs> 
I could pontificate the book, but I wasn't living what it was saying. It wasn't internal. See, it wasn't here. And after about three years of that pain, trying to win this girl's heart back again, I, I, I says, you know, I'm, I, I got to follow directions here. Maybe I should take pen to paper, and write it out. So I finally wrote down. I said, God, remove me from the from this bondage that I have, you know. And I woke up the next day, and I had some relief, and I knew I tapped into a greater source in myself. And right at that point, man, I really grabbed onto this thing because I had the emotional displacement right then. And if you read it in Chapter 2 on 27, and Dr. Wong, I think it's Wong or Chung, I can't even say his name. I've been saying it for years. He was talking to this hopeless alcoholic, right? And the hopeless alcoholic was going, isn't there any hope for me? And the doctor says to him, yeah, once in a while these men have had what is called a psychic change. To me, they appear to be in the form of a phenomena called an emotional displacement, where the old ideas, attitudes, and emotions that used to govern the lives of these men have been rearranged and a whole new set begin to dominate them. i got to tell you, folks, until that happens at some point in your career of alcoholism, it's going to be, you're going to, I'm going to be very frank about this, you're going to be battling this thing. Because you're trying to figure it out. I thought if I just stayed sober and be, be Gary the same way I was before, everything would be fine. What a mistake that was. You know, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't do it anymore. Because when I did step four, when I did that inventory on me, you know, I was taught that when you get in here, we're, we're taught to trust God and clean house. Well, you know, you, you got a rock. I had a good friend of mine give me a rock. I practiced that principle. That was good. You turn it over, you look at it, and you discard it. That's what you do. Four does that, and you get to five, and now you're talking to another human being, and you've got to be transparent and disclose this shit. And I was trying to hold back, and I didn't want to tell him anything. I told him half truth. You know what happens when you tell half truth? You pay a price for it. You pay a price. And I sure did. I'll tell you, I paid a price, an emotional price. That emotional sobriety is the, is one of the biggest things that we're going to be fighting in this thing. The drink is not the issue. Up in this cranium, there's all kinds of squirrels running around. How many of you get a good night's sleep? No hands, hardly any. Some do. <laughs> Must be taking drugs or something. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's hard to shut the brain down. You know, it really is. Because you're trying to project tomorrow's activities and it's not even here yet. I can't live tomorrow. That's where my fears are. If I had any. Well, I don't have any more fears anymore because I got this God conscious. A certain amount, you know. And on the other side of that spectrum is trying to relive yesterday. And that's all the past. You can't do anything about it. How do you want to feel today? Right here. I want to be happy. You know, I had a good day being comfortable in my epidermis. That's skin, in case you don't know what that means. <laughs> but I feel pretty good in this in this body right now. I, I mean, I understand my flaws, my character defects, and I know how to take care of resentments. I had a resentment one time on a good friend of mine, and I mean, it was two months, and I'm going, you know, just like the book says, I cut up, cut me off from the sunlight of the spirit. I didn't want God blessing not to, to <clears throat> not to be in the way, so I, I wrote out. I wrote out that resentment and uh, I turned it over to the to the other side of the page and I, I started to look at the effect of what this resentment had on me. Did it affect my spiritual life? Did it affect me financially? Did it affect me sexually? Did it affect my ego, my pride? I looked at all those items and I said, I would have never had the resentment if I hadn't made the choice to get it. You see? Because on that 62, it says, selfishness, self-centered is the, is the root of our problem. Driven by a hundred forms of what? Fear, self-delusion, and self-seeking. And then we step on the toes of our fellow man, and they retaliate against us without provocation. But the last sentence is what gets people. But we invariably find at some point in the past, you made the decision that later puts you in a position to get hurt. Anybody have a credit card in here they don't want? <laughs> Did anybody break your arm to sign that application? I don't think so. They didn't on me. Then I got mad at them for chasing down the money that I owed them. <laughs> you know what I mean? That is over the top. Responsible citizen of society? Not hardly. But I learned that here. 
how to be one? I don't learn that here. Six is what? Be, what does this say on six? It says we're entirely ready to have God to remove all these defects of character. You got to ask yourself, are you ready or not? You know, I don't know. <clears throat> I was ready. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired of being who I was. And I knew something had to change because I was at the point in my life, like it says in chapter 11, I was at that stepping off point and I wanted it over with because the loneliness was so deep because I had terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair chasing me in the four horsemen and they were running me down. And I said, something's got to change here. And I did. I made a quantum leap in my life to be somebody different and allow God to control me instead of me trying to push that square peg through that round hole and having it my way. Because it wasn't going in. Damn it. I mean, the matter I got, the further away from getting at it, you know, it was nuts. Now, when you're thinking like that and you put a skirt in your life, <laughs> you're going to have problems. Because <laughs> you got another human being to deal with, right? So I just said, well, stand back. You know, I didn't want to get in trouble like that. And so that was pretty cool. And seven, uh, somebody asked him to move short come, we do that one. And then we got to make this list of amends, right? <clears throat> of all the people we hurt. Oh my gosh. That, that was a hard one. I mean, I was the king of I'm sorry, but that wasn't cutting it. They wanted to see action. They wanted to see something. I've got my, I got two gifts from God out of the three that he gave me with daughters and they both my oldest one is from my first marriage, four years with her mother, and 26 with my youngest daughter's wife. And I'm telling you what, I ruined two people because of my self-centeredness, and it killed me. You know, and I didn't know what the problem was. I was a spoiled little brat is what I was. I need to be spanked. And you know what happened? God spanked me. He spanked me hard, and I had to get humbled. And I got humbled all right. Because everything had been taken away from me that I had love. And he took everything away that was love that I had cherished. And you name it. Had this big custom redwood house out in East County. Had boats. Had RVs. All the monies. And he, and he took it away just to get me in order. You don't have to lose everything to be sober. You know that, right? You don't have to. And so what's really cool about it, you you can hang on to it. And maybe he'll allow you to keep that. I don't know. I know this. If you're married... That's a gift from God. You better put her on a pedestal. Make, you better make her feel important to your wife. I'm talking to the guys and vice versa because that's a gift from God. And I don't want to ruin that. And I did already. Like I said, you disrespect the gift that God has given you and you're going to pay a price for it. And that's what happened. And then you go down the list around these steps. And I'm talking about these steps because a lot of people never explain this in detail. Your sponsor should do that, and that's good, and I hope he does. I'm not taking anything away from that. You know, we made amends to people wherever possible except when to hurt them. Now, some of these amends that I made, to walk up and say, I'm sorry, you might get punched because you found this new religion or spiritual thing, and they're not going to believe you. Believe me, they're just not going to believe you. And so, you know, I had to be careful about that. <clears throat> you know, and... And it gets down here to 10, continue to take personal inventory. Now, that's a big one for me. I want to spend a little time on that one because that's something that we need to do on a daily basis with ourselves. We took an inventory of ourselves. And I do that every morning. I says, you know, let me be a vessel for you, not for myself, as much as I possibly can. And I do that third step prayer and the Lord's prayer in the morning, get on my knees. And I do it every day, every day. <laughs> Because once that spiritual morality is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. And if you want to stay sober for a long time, you've got to practice what it says on 85, you know. We've got a daily reprieve based upon the maintenance of our spiritual conditioning. Now, most of you drive automobiles, right? I'm sure you do maintenance on that, right? Or you won't get from point A to point B. Tires, oil, whatever. Right here, too. Why don't we fix this? Why don't we get right inside? And understand that the real problem exists internally. And that's what I had to do. I do that in 11, continue to meditate uh, through meditation to increase my conscious contact with the God of my own understanding. Meditation is good stuff. 
because now I can shut it down. I, when I first went to one of these meditation meetings, I was, son of a bitch, I can't sit here for one minute. <laughs> Ten minutes of music with squirrels and birds singing in the background. I, are you kidding me? Put on some ACDC. Let's crank this meditation up. <laughs> I says, God, where's, you know, where's, where's Led Zeppelin and, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix? I can't, I don't understand this. Oh, kumbaya, you know, it's like, holy moly. I says, kumbaya, you, let me get out of here. You know, and it was one of those things. Crazy stuff. And 12 was continued to take, you know, continued to have a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. Now, they talk about a spiritual awakening, you know, like, wow, you're waiting for Bill's, in Bill's story, he had this bright light in his room that flashed. I didn't have that. I had the psychic change. Because people were telling me that I was talking and acting differently. Yeah. You know, if you read Bill's story, we alcoholics are just like on page two where he talks about, you know, you're commencing to forge a weapon that one day boomeranged you and cut your legs out all from underneath you. Well, that's what it is. Alcohol is a weapon. Go ahead and destroy your life. You know, DUI, DUIs are real cheap, aren't they? My God. I got one of those. Yeah. Thank you. I got one of those and, and they threw me in jail. I was first arrested when I was 14, 13 or 14, something like that, in La Mesa. You know, you're drinking beer, and you're with an older kid, and he's, he dares you to do something. And So we had this big lemon tree in the backyard, and he says, let's throw lemons at the people driving through the dry, dry, throwing lemons at cars going by. The only problem was we were throwing them further than the street, and they were landing in the neighbor across the street. <laughs> and he come over. What for you throw lemons at my house? I do nothing to you. Nothing to you. I call police. No, no, no. And we go over there and try to pick him up. Woo! Now, the kid I was with, he got into jail with me, and he was crying. I says, you wuss. What are you talking about, man? His parents come and got him real early. My dad was in a big poker game. He says, keep him overnight. <laughs> that was the old man, you know? It's crazy stuff. <clears throat> and then when I got arrested on the DUI, that was real good. Barney Fife, you know? I didn't get these stripes for nothing. Okay. And I'll, you know, I got to finish one more story, and then I'll, get, I'll, I'll finish with some good stuff um, about AA. But you know, just because you've been sober for a little while, you, you think you're going to be a normal citizen of society and not do anything, right? Here I was, two years into the program, and I'm on Queer Mac out here in Santee. Now I don't know why I was hanging on to this resentment about the police force, but I was. <laughs> Two cop cars pull up to me on the right-hand side, and I'm in the third lane, and I'm under 52 in Cuyamaca. For some reason, my right hand made a right turn with my truck right into that cop car. And they pulled me over, and I looked at the dude. I said, why'd you run into me? He goes, no, you ran into me. I said, no, I, you ran it. No, 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 I got to call this in. Four sheriffs show up. They give, I give him my driver's license. It wasn't more than three minutes. They ran that number through, men. Four, four more sheriff cars pull up. I'm on the trolley tracks. The trolley has stopped. This is beautiful. I'm in AA, right? <laughs> I'm supposed to be a normal function of citizen of society, right? <coughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm still reckless. And uh, the funny part about it was, this is how stupid I was at that point. I mean, it was crazy insane. They let me go. <laughs> And they said, just turn it into your insurance company. I said, okay. And I drove away with a laugh because I knew my insurance had expired two weeks earlier and they didn't catch it. <laughs> God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. <laughs> Think about that one, folks. He's doing that all the time in your lives. You don't even know it. Rejection is your protection. Keep that in mind, you know. So uh, that was that was crazy. But I got to tell you, folks, I like to have a good time at, at the same time. But these are all true stories, you know. I mean, I gave up the drugs in 80. I took an LSD. I took everything. You name it. Peyote, heroin, LSD, mescaline, all that stuff. Jimi Hendrix concert on, uh, on Reds. And I just got back into concerts again. I'm all fired up about that. I'm going to go see Fleetwood Mac, so I'm fired up about that. <laughs> a lot of hands above. Can I go? But uh, anyway, uh I'm just grateful for AA. I, I, you know, he's given me these beautiful gifts from God. My two, two out of my three, my three daughters. And you know what, what's ironic about that? They never stopped loving me during all that process. I mean, my first three years, I was living in my truck. 
And nobody knew it. And I was in AA being a contractor. Everything's groovy. <laughs> groovy. Or like my mom used to say, that's really bitching, isn't it? <laughs> oh, you're 16. Look at the hair. Beep. <laughs> She'd walk up. I don't like the way you look. Boom. I didn't do anything. She's a little sawed off Norwegian, tough girl. But I'm a blessed man today. I, I, I really am. Uh, my life's never been better. Uh, I, uh, I've got some money. I got some shillings in my pocket that I can use and, uh, I can pay my bills on time. I got a roof over my head, you know, and, uh, I've been single for about eight or nine years. I don't date that much, you know, it's too confusing. Not that I won't go on a date with somebody. Don't get me wrong. If you got the way to ask me, I say yes. <laughs> <coughs> but if I ask you, go, whoa, poison, poison. <laughs> That's Gary, man, the long-haired hippie. I only grew this hair because I wanted to show my daughters I could still grow hair, I guess. <laughs> I tell everybody that I grew my hair because they wanted me to. They never said that. This is all self-serving, you know. Oh, man, flash it. But I do ask ladies what, what shampoo they use for their hair because I don't want <laughs> What shampoo do you use? They go, don't use this one. <laughs> so I look for the shiniest hair and walk up, and that's a good introduction. You know, I just, ah. But uh, AA will give you a, a life that you never knew existed if you want it. It really will. And I, I can tell you that the book of Alcoholics Anonymous is going to be your savior to a point. The meetings are good. You get that warm, fuzzy feeling. The psychological advantage of being in a meeting is helpful. I mean, I was, I've been going to 12, 12 to 15 meetings a week for over nine years. You know, some of them, my home group is the OB peer group at seven o'clock on Sunday morning. I found that by accident. Then I got another group in La Mesa here with, with a friend of mine that took me camping, finally taught me how to have a sense of humor after three years, get out there and make these funny marshmallow things. Uh, at, at helmet heads over a closet pole with Bisquick, you know, and whipped cream. I, I fell into a wacko farm. I swear to God, I was going, man, this is nuts. But I, I really care a lot about that one person because she taught me how to, how to how to laugh and smile. I tell you, because every time she ever shared, all she had was that big smile on her face. I go, Jesus, what is she so freaking happy about? <laughs> I wasn't happy. I just sit next to me. I'll talk to you. You know? Oh, yeah. It was bad. I mean, <clears throat> you know, burn the idea on 98. It's real simple. You're taught one basic thing here and one basic foundation. Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man. It's the idea we can get well regardless of who we are. The only condition is that we trust God and clean house. Cleaning house is this. So you don't have to say you're sorry all the time and make the amends. You know, and it just, I, I get, I get, I get a little teary eyed about the stuff that I have to fix. And, uh, I don't know. I got this huge heart. I know how to give love and not expect to receive it today. And that's coming from a self-centered person like me. That's, that's pretty good stuff. That's pretty good stuff. A will give you anything you want. Follow the dictates of a higher power and you and the person that's next to you can enjoy a wonderful life together. So I'm just honored that you would allow me to talk tonight, and uh, God bless. Have a great day tomorrow. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.